Yeah. Hello? Right. Good evening. We're about to start our talk. Um, tonight's speaker is Daniel Mossett. He is a PhD student. Are you a candidate now? Not yet. He's still a PhD student at UNLV in civil engineering. Uh, his talk tonight is on introduction to probabilistic machine learning using graphical models with STAN, in particular R STAN. Yes? Yes. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for the evening. <laughs> So um, this particular talk uh, is just going to be an introduction to this whole field of probabilistic machine learning. So we're going to barely scratch the surface of probabilistic machine learning. And so the idea, the objective is to introduce some of these tools and uh, um, show what other tools are out there for performing you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence, particularly probabilistic machine learning. So I. I hope you guys have all the materials. I uh, put up code, the slides, um, data as well, and uh, a whole R Markdown document um, that you guys can download and follow along. And we're going to be running some R code as well, so it would be nice for you to have, you know, the R Markdown and the data. Oh, this on, on, on GitHub, yeah. So this will take you to GitHub directly. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to it's just bitly slash intro dash pml dash lv all right it's so downloading the whole zip file okay so hope you have it um so there is a lot of excitement out there in machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, particularly in deep learning. And there are a lot of uh, applications out there that are exciting. And typically when you speak to somebody about machine learning and artificial intelligence, their mind straight away thinks about deep learning and neural networks. And I wanted to um, demonstrate some other tools within the machine learning uh, toolbox that can perform the job um, as good as deep learning tools do, particularly uh, probabilistic machine learning uh, applications. And so I wanted to use first examples here, um, real world examples. For example, in this one here, this is a, uh, a tool developed by Microsoft Research for their uh, Xbox 360. And what they did, they wanted to um, be able to create a system that is able to match players based on their uh, quality so that you know players of equal uh, abilities can play against each other and enjoy you know the playing experience on uh, Xbox 360 and they used a probabilistic ap approach for doing this um, and it's published in uh, in this paper here that you can read down there uh, at a later time and this is running currently since, I think, 2009 on their Xbox 360 application online. And lots of players, millions of players, are being matched using this, this probabilistic framework. Uh, the second application is in autonomous vehicles, particularly Uber, uh, the Uber artificial intelligence vehicle, uses a probabilistic approach called Bayesian optimization to, um, to, to be able to automatically uh, develop models that can learn parameters automatically from some of the black box expensive functions that they're using in, in their system. And um, so here the objective was that, you know, there are a lot of parameters in, they use this particular uh, application called Bayesian optimization for deep neural networks to be able to learn parameters in their deep neural networks that they were using. But the problem here was that um, they had tons, millions and millions of parameters, and they were spending a lot of man hours having their engineers 
tune these parameters and try to get the, uh, the best parameters. And so they decided to use Bayesian optimization to automate that process. And Bayesian optimization is a probabilistic uh, machine learning framework. So there are quite some applications out there, exciting applications. Um, the third one is, um, if you've read about this, it's called Google Project Loon. Uh, they're using these balloons to be able to supply internet to remote areas. And what the tool that they're using is called a Gaussian process. And later on, we'll, uh, we'll talk about what Gaussian processes are. And the idea here was that they wanted to be able to <coughs> have a few number of balloons um, fly over remote areas and be able to supply internet to these areas um, for longer periods of time and have those balloons stay up um, in the atmosphere for a very long period of time. And then the last application um, uh, was performed by some researchers at Columbia where they wanted to understand traffic, congest uh, traffic patterns in the city of Porto and they had millions and millions of trajectories of taxi trips being made in the city. And they wanted to find out, you know, what are the patterns, which areas are being traveled more often and at what times and for what periods of times. And so they used Gaussian mixer models for this, another probabilistic machine learning tool that you can use. So that's just to motivate um, the talk and to show you that there are actually exciting tools out there being developed based on this framework here. So let's, uh, let's get to learn a little bit what probabilistic machine learning is. So one could define probabilistic machine learning as um, a system that develops uh, models of data. And to do that, we must be able to do it automatically. And when I say model, that is just a description of data that you could observe from a system. So your model should be able to uh, produce data from the system that you're trying to study. And, and if that's the case, then your model should be able to make predictions, uh, should be able to make comparisons between other models. And since this model is describing data that you could observe from the system that you're trying to study, then um, you should be able to also know when it doesn't know, right? It should be able to quantify uncertainty in the model parameters. And to do that, we can employ the mathematics of probability theory to be able to quantify uncertainty in our model. So uncertainty is contributed by a lot of items, for example, the model parameters, there you could, there's uncertainty around model parameters. Um, the data that you have uh, could have a lot of measurement error in there, and so you wanna be able to capture that in your model. Um, also, the proposed model as well could have uncertainty and you wanna be able to quantify that. So what we could do is just use uh, the language of probability theory to capture uncertainty and we don't have to you know, invoke any new math or anything else. We just use probability theory that we pro probably all learned during uh, the first year of, of undergrad. And it entirely depends on that. So we don't need to invent any new math, we just stick to this uh, probability theory. And if that's the case, then it's really very simple. Everything then follows from two simple rules of probability. Uh, you have the sum rule and the product rule. And let's see, where's that mouse right there? So this is the sum rule here and the product rule. Those are the two main rules that, will, that you will always use in this framework here. It's very consistent. All that you need to learn uh, at the fundamental level are these two rules. And then you'll apply these two rules to um, potentially every problem that you're working on. So uh, to refresh our undergrad knowledge, so the sum rule is just the uh, the marginal distribution of some random variable x here, uh, and then you marginalize over the joint probability distribution between all the random variables that you have. And then uh, in the product rule, will be defined as the joint probability distribution 
is just the product of the margin of x and um, the conditional margin of y given x. So those are the two rules. You just manipulate them. And when you manipulate them, for example, down here, what you get is uh, whatever what is known as the inverse probability or otherwise known as the uh, Bayes theorem. So here if we were to uh, replace x and y with um, theta to, to denote parameters and d for the data and for the model, what this is is your posterior distribution over the parameters given the data and the model. And then here you have uh, the data likelihood. Here you have uh, the prior distribution over the parameters, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then here down here you have the joint distribution over all the data that you, that you have. So basically everything follows from these two rules, and once you know this, and once you get comfortable with this, then you can be able to manipulate all kinds of uh, problems that you want to work on to, to be able to uh, learn parameters of data. And then uh, another important key idea is when you're performing prediction in this framework here, you still invoke these two rules. But now when you're performing prediction of, for example, the, uh, the random variable x here, so it is those predictions here given by this uh, probability here but then you weight them with um, the prior distribution of the parameters. So in this, oh no, this is the prior. Oh, this is the posterior that we obtained, sorry. This is the posterior that we obtained. And so you're not just looking for that single best predictive value. You're trying to average over all the uncertainty that you have in your model. And this is one of the uh, key differences between what we'll uh, define later as the <coughs> traditional or algorithmic machine learning. And then in the, same, uh, in the same logic, to perform model comparisons, because you may have developed several models of your system, and you want to find out which one does better on, on the data. So you still use this same um, idea of the sum rule and the product rule to do the same, so everything is very consistent. All you need to know are these two uh, rules. Yes? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But here, yeah, so, and here we're talking in distributions, there we're we'll talking, yeah. So that's basically it, in fact, you know, that's it, the talk could actually end there, but let's, let's look more into, uh, into this idea. So obviously we've talked about probabilistic machine learning, but how different is it from the traditional way most people do machine learning? And for a lack of a better term, I'll, I'll say, I'll define it as traditional or algorithmic machine learning. And uh, these are uh, my personal differences, um, people could have different ideas on what their differences are. So if we look at examples, um, in the algorithmic machine learning case, you find common, you know, common algorithms that we use, k-means clustering, um, Kalman filters, uh, hidden Markov models, and the kind. So those could be categorized into, um, into the algorithmic side. Whereas on the probabilistic machine learning side, you'd have tools such as Gaussian mixer models for clustering, uh, Gaussian processes, and, and others. And in their specification, uh, the key differences in the algorithmic side is the model and the algorithm are sort of tied together. And you can't separate that. If you were to separate that, then that would mean inventing a new algorithm. So you have to use it as is. For example, in the Kalman filter, uh, it's typically used to, uh, for sequential data analysis when um, your unknowns are continuous. And so if your response variable now is no longer continuous of a continuous type, then you can't use the Kalman filter because that's what it was designed for. And so you'd have to shift then to 
another algorithm, maybe a hidden Markov model for that. So the model and the inference algorithm are tied together. So you can't break those two. Whereas in the probabilistic machine learning framework, probably this is one of its greatest strength, is that you could come up with any model of your system that you're trying to study and then just invoke some general inference algorithm to perform inference on your, on your model. Um, in the algor algorithmic side, when, so you have data and you have uh, so some unknown quantities in any model, and on the algorithmic side, those are referred to as parameters, and on the probabilistic side, they are uh, random variables, so everything is expressed as a random variable. Um, on the algorithmic side, during inference, uh, the most common technique that is used is optimization, particularly maximum likelihood estimation or a variant of that, maybe penalized maximum likelihood estimation. Whereas on the probabilistic side, um, you have uh, Bayes' theorem used, particularly Markov chain Monte Carlo estimation and some other uh, variants of that. And uh, to perform regularization, and that is uh, penalizing parameters that are not consistent with uh, the system that you're trying to model, in the algorithmic side, uh, you have to define penalty terms, whereas, whereas in the uh, probabilistic side, you'd use priors to constrain your parameters. And then uh, the last uh, differentiation factor is um, the solutions that you obtain from performing the two uh, techniques. So in the traditional side, you'd have a single best fit value, that value that maximizes the probability of observing data, whereas on the algorithmic side, you have a full posterior distribution of your parameters and, uh, and uh, over maybe predicted quantities. So that, that is the key difference, and probably from your experiences doing machine learning or statistical modeling, you, could, you, could, you can you know, appreciate some of these key differences. All right, so, oh, wait a second. Yeah, I think. So remember in this, uh, in this context, I talked about, when one of the key differences I talked about um, the idea of being able to develop a model and then just inv invoke any inference algorithm to perform inference on your model, regardless of what type of model it is. So there is this new wave in computer programming uh, that is referred to as pluralistic programming where you, it basically gives you that platform to do that. You define a model and then just call this inference, any inference algorithm that is available to be able to perform inference. And some of these uh, probabilistic programming languages do even generate the underlying, the low level uh, code that you can then use and embed in, in the system that you're building. So examples here include stan, infer.net, PyM's three, there's Edward, and there are some other, uh, some other probabilistic programming languages as well. And today we're going to look at Stan particularly. Um, yes. So Stan has its own language. Is this one just has one format? That's right. We're going to look. Yeah, we're going to look at that in just a moment. Yeah. So there are three simple steps in this framework here. You disc the first step is you know you write. Um, the, uh, the model, which is just a joint probability distribution of all um, the variables. And then combine that with the data. In, then in a single line of code, just call the inference algorithm to perform inference on your, on your, on your model. And in this uh, figure here, that's, that's what it looks like generally in most pro probabilistic programming languages. This one particularly is Stan, and we're going to look at some code. Uh, in just a moment. So this is basically what you, you would do. This is uh, a stand program and it has your model. So data right up here, parameters, and the model. And that is all you will need to do. And then to perform inference, we'll see later on, it's just one single line of code that will perform inference over all this model here. So let's get Let's get into some code, you know. Um, so how does Stan work? So to motivate, to see how Stan works, let's use a, a very simple example. So we can learn these uh, components of 
the stand probabilistic programming language. And for that, we're going to use uh, this simple example where we would like to um, learn about a response variable here, MPG, as a function of displacement. So we're going to uh, describe a, a, a function here, y, which is our response. As a f it is a function of x. That will be uh, one of our covariates. And then um, add some additive noise there. And in this simple example, we'll assume that the function here that relates y to x is linear with uh, an intercept and a slope factor here. And then we'll assume the noise um, is Gaussian, centered around zero with uh, variance sigma squared. So let's get into some code and then see um, what stan looks like. Does that look clear? Yeah, it does. Mm, but it doesn't look clear on my, on my screen. But anyway. So, oh? Uh, OK. Um, so I'm making a general assumption here that, you know, since this is a Las Vegas R user group, we've played around with R. Have we all played around with R a little bit? Yeah. So this doesn't look very unfamiliar, right? OK. So let me see. I wish I could mirror the screen. So um, first, we're going to load some uh, libraries, particularly R stand. So I hope you do have the R markdown file so you could we could run it along, or you, you could just um, follow along and, and watch. So Stan, general purpose uh, programming language, but it has interfaces uh, for R, Python, Julia. So you could use Python, Julia, and I think Stata as well to be able to access Stan programs and run inference. So you don't need to be um, an R user. So the, the library that we're going to load is R stand. And we need some other accompanying libraries that we'll use for you know, a little bit of data manipulation and visualization. So for example, in the tidyverse, uh, this is another uh, library. Uh, it's a collection of libraries that we'll use. It has ggplot in there that we shall use for, um, for visualization. And then there's base plot as well. So let me just go ahead and just load those in my system. So that's loaded. And then the data, uh, I said earlier, the data that we're going to use is auto MPG data. I got the data from um, the UCI machine learning repository. It has plenty of data sets up there that you can play with. And inside there, we have MPG, um, the cylinders, the displacement, host power, and we're just going to use MPG and displacement just to learn how uh, STAN works. So we already described um, the model that we're going to use. We're going to assume the data is continuous. So MPG here uh, is continuous data. And for that, the distribution, we're going to use a Gaussian distribution with some mean. And that mean is the expectation of y given x, and we'll assume a linear predictor for that. Um, so let's uh, manipulate the data a little bit and create a data list that we'll uh, input into R. So there are a couple of steps here. First, we'll prepare the data. And so here, what I'm doing, um, dividing the data. So we've already read in the MPG data set. And here I need a train data set and a test data set. And I'm going to take 70% to train the model and 30% and, uh, for testing. <coughs> and uh, oh, did you have a question about that? <laughs> there are different techniques that you could do, cross-validation with several others. But 
for simplicity, we'll just do this. Um, our response variable is the MPG. Uh, our covariate there is uh, displacement. We need um, uh, the sample size, and that is N. Um, we need the, uh, well, we already know what the, uh, the dimension of the data is, just one, one variable. And then also we'll create prediction and uh, prediction data set. And so I'll combine all of this into a list because stand takes data as a list. So we'll go ahead and, yeah. 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 So when you're when you're creating the estimate for the data, say that again. Your estimate is doing a more request for the data that is going into your sample. Oh. You've only got you've only got your replacement time. You don't have any sample. Yeah. So. So it's not supposed to be there. It's not supposed to be there. Here, I'm just collecting just the data purely. And then um, the next step, that is step two, will build the model. And it's built as a stand program. It's recommended to do it in a separate file. So I have that file as well in here called linearbase.stand. But let's just look at what it, uh, what it looks like here. So all the yellow stuff is essentially what we don't know if you see it as all text files. Yeah. In fact, you know what? see it here on my computer. Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, so it's in here. So linear base that stand. So that is its separate file. And the file that I'm running is this one here. So you all have you should have them in the same uh, in the same folder. So basically, um, a stand program is made up of three blocks. You have the data block, here, you have the parameters, and then you have the model. Those are the basic three blocks that I used. So in the data, obviously you describe the data that you have and um, the size of that data. So for example here, D um, is the dimension of the data, and we already created it in the data file. And then N here is just the uh, sample size. We have X, um, which is that covariate. If you had more than uh, more than one covariate, then it'd still be uh, an N by D matrix. And then the response variable is Y. So you describe your data in the data block. And then we have also uh, data for performing prediction. So you have uh, the sample size for the, predict, uh, for the data that you're going to use for prediction and the, um, the, uh, the covariates from the test data set. So that's what you would do in the data block. And then in the parameters block, that's where you would define the parameters of your model. Um, for example, we, from our model, we have the intercept, the slope, and then um, the uh, standard deviation. So that's what you would do in the parameters block. And then uh, finally, the model would just be the joint probability distribution. So your likelihood and then priors over um, uh, those parameters. So for example, in this case, oh, I think there's an error here. This should be the prior and the intercept. So the, there is a whole, you know, literature and discussion over priors, we're not gonna get into that, but essentially, basically what they should be is um, your state of knowledge about those parameters um, before you've seen the data. So here for, for example, for the intercept here, I use a Gaussian centered around zero uh, with 10 standard deviation. We have the slope and then uh, we have um, this sigma in the error term. So those are your priors. Uh, yeah, this is a Cauchy distribution. So this is supposed to uh, encode, capture your state of beliefs about the parameters before you've seen the data. Uh, in STAN, if you don't um, 
spe specify these priors, it will assume a uniform prior over those, um, over those parameters. And then this is the likelihood here, which is uh, Gaussian, with the mean being this linear predictor and uh, the standard deviation. So for every problem that you'll do, so this is a very simple problem, obviously, because we want to use it to show how STAN works. But it, even in the m very complex problems, this is the general workflow. All you need to do is just describe your model this way, and then later we'll see how we're going to uh, invoke this general inference algorithm to be able to perform inference over this algorithm. Um, there are optional blocks, and one of them here that I've shown is a generated quantities block. And here, um, if you want to, in this block, you'd use it to um, describe any random variables that you want to generate from the posteriors that you've obtained from your model. And so here, I want to get predictions, new predictions on the test uh, data set. So that's why Fred. And so that's why I would put it in um, the generated quantities block. And it uses this function here, a Gaussian random number generator. And it takes in the test data set here, uh, multiplies that by the slope from our, the posterior distributions that we've estimated. Uh, plus the intercept and then with the uh, sigma here. So those are the three uh, here, four, but then the basic fundamental blocks are those three, the data, the parameters, and the model. And for every problem, you'll basically follow the same, uh, the same process. So let's get back to... So we've, that was step two, we built the model. And then step three, uh, what STAN allows you to do is to translate that STAN program, that was a STAN program that we developed, into um, C++ code, because it's more efficient for performing inference. And then it will translate that C++ code uh, to computer code that we'll be able to load later and run. So let's do that. Um, it takes some time, obviously, to translate. But since I already ran this, it should have no problem. Yeah. It, it recalled, basically what it is recalled from, from memory what I'd already run. But typically, when you're doing this for the very first time, it will take some time, especially if you have uh, a complex model. And now, um, and now that we have the compiled model, we can now perform sampling. So that is now step four. We can sample from the posterior distribution and so.